This episode contains descriptions of rape and sexual assault. It may be triggering to some. Please take this into consideration before listening. Powerful Conversations Humanhood, a podcast where we confront America's adopted psychopathic nature by diving headfirst into difficult and honest conversations about the state of humanhood. I'm your host, Tamara Graham, with co-host Leisha Moody Miller. We welcome you to the conversation. This episode is sponsored by Square 5, powerful products that confronts our internal dialogue to help inspire our external dialogue for a more purposeful, driven world. Command your voice at square5.com. That's S-Q-U-A-R-E, number five, I-V-E, dot com. The year was 1993, and 23-year-old Leisha was a graduate student in Alabama. Her live-in boyfriend worked the night shift at a local hotel. One night, while she was home alone, snuggled comfortably in bed and fast asleep, she was jolted awake by the heaviness of a stranger on top of her. This is her story. I was in graduate school, so I was working in a summer program to, like, orientate freshmen coming in, and we would get credit for it. So we had had an orientation day, and then um, it was this middle, it was a summer day, so um, I didn't have a, I didn't work that day. It was, it was all focused on school and, and doing this summer program. But I got back at home, and my boyfriend was going to work that night. He worked overnight in a hotel. and. Um, So I I just did some normal things around my house, you know, went to bed probably around 10 or 11 because I had to get up pretty early the next morning. So I was really in a deep sleep. I I had been asleep for a while um, and I, I was awoken from the sleep because I felt someone on top of me. And at the same time, I was feeling that. I was feeling my eyes being covered and my and my legs being bound. And so it felt like a dream at first. I mean, I, I really was trying to orientate myself. And because I couldn't see, I could smell. And I smelled sweat and oil, like somebody had been working on a car. And then he immediately started trying to get my shorts down. And I don't know how long that lasted because, you know, in the middle of a crisis, you don't recognize time. But it felt like forever from the time I woke up until it started sinking in, this was really happening. So as soon as I realized it was really happening, I started resisting and fly on, you know, just flailing my arms around, trying to get a sense of what was happening, and trying to develop some kind of plan in my head. And while I'm developing a plan in my head, I'm, I start crying and begging and, you know, saying, no, please stop. And um, I flailed my hands around enough that I felt, and at this point, he had gotten my shorts off and he was starting to sexually assault me. And I flailed around and my hand felt something in his back pocket and it felt long and sharp. And I I just remember thinking, you know, he's going to kill me. At that point, I think I started to beg even more. Was he talking to you at all during this? Oh, yeah. He. And what was he saying to you? 
this is so good. It feels so good. He was totally oblivious to me as a human being. It was all about him meeting this need. And it was as if I didn't exist. I was just a body. He didn't respond to me when I said these things like, please stop, please don't hurt me. And he just kept going. It, it was like he didn't hear me or didn't want to hear me. He was, he was so into what he was doing. And so I start thinking about like, well, what's, what's in the room? What can I get? How, wh- but I was under the weight of his body and I was, my hand, my, 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 my feet were tied. And so I didn't, at some point. So he didn't, he didn't tie your hands. He blindfolded you and tied your feet, but he left your hands free. Right. So as much as I resisted or tried to push him off of me, he was too heavy. Um, and the, and going back to what you felt in his back pocket, did you ever, did you ever discover what that was? As far as I could tell, it may have been something he used to get into my, my place because the back door had been kind of jimmied open. I don't know to this day what it was. I don't really know. I don't even know what he had on his person, you know, at the time he entered my house because I couldn't see. And there's so many things flowing through your brain in the middle of a sexual assault. First of all, my brain was telling me, how can I keep from dying? was really my ultimate goal. And in in that moment, I felt like I couldn't avoid being raped. There was no way out of being raped. But if I could keep from dying, that was my ultimate end goal. And so he moved me around. Um, Again, it's hard to tell how long this lasted. It could have been 15 minutes. It could have been 45. I don't know. But he moved me around the room in different positions. And each time it was hard for me to move because my legs were still bound. I still couldn't see. But I knew he was moving me in different positions to further assault me. Ultimately, that assault went on for a while. At some point, I heard him leave the room. And or what sounded like him moving around and leaving the room. So I sat there trying to think of how long I could sit there and before I could leave and get out of there. So I yelled out, I said, Is anybody there? I heard it, but before that, I heard him going through stuff in my living room. He ultimately robbed me too. And and then after that, I just finally said, Is anybody there? And he didn't answer. And I thought, oh my gosh, is he gone? And so I took off the blindfold and I was like peering around, trying to see if he was there. I didn't see him. I untangled my feet and I immediately went to the phone and called my boyfriend. And he was like, call the police right away, you know, which of course I did. And the police came and a series of questions, you know, I couldn't identify him. It was 1993. So they took fingerprints where they thought there was fingerprints, but I could not give them a description of the man at all. At that point, they recommended, you know, I go to get a rape kit done or to get an exam. And they took me to the hospital. And that was very hard because of the way they gather evidence is almost like you're being violated all over again. And I know that's not the goal, but that's how it feels. I cried. I couldn't stop crying through the whole exam. I couldn't stop crying because I realized what had happened to me as well. So it was just, my emotions were so raw. And I remember the ER doc He did something so humane that it meant the world to me because it's a very clinical experience. And they've gotten much better at that, doing these kits over the years. But at the end of the exam, he came up to me and he talked to me and he told me he was done. And he just patted me on the arm really lightly. And I just 
lost it because I felt so inhumane at that moment. I felt like I just didn't feel like a person. And he treated me like a person, just in a small way, but it just meant the world to me because I didn't have, you know, I was in there by myself. My husband was, boyfriend was trying to get there and he made it to the hospital and took me home. And of course, I wanted to take a shower and they had taken all my clothes and put me in a scrubs. So I went in the bathroom and it it just all kind of sunk in. Okay. I've, I've been sexually assaulted in my own home. I don't know who did it. And, you know, I don't know what to do now. It was a very hopeless feeling. It's not the first time I felt hopeless from that, but it's not the last time I felt hopeless, but it was certainly the first. Then I did something that I realized later is pretty common. I tried to ignore it. I tried to get back to normalcy. I I called in because we were supposed to be doing this, uh, this program with the college freshmen. I called, you know, my, my professor and I told him what happened and they said, take as much time as you want. And I was like, no, I'll be back. I'll be back tomorrow. Cause in my mind at that moment, I'm not physically hurt. Right. He never physically cut me or, you know, I was bruised, but I didn't feel like I had enough damage to really take time off. That's that's what went through. Not really mind. understanding the the mental trauma. Totally ignored that the you mental just trauma. Went through. Yeah. It was like, no, nah, that's good. I've got that covered, you know. And so that's what I did. I went back the next day and tried to pretend like it never happened. And then about a week or how long did that last? Well, it broke down. It broke down badly in the, in the next few years. Um, but it was it was almost like I needed that reprieve in a way to feel like this didn't really happen to me. You know, they say our brains really give us denial to help us, you know, absorb. And I think that's what it was doing for me. But I went back to see the detectives about a week or so later and retold my story. And I was very focused because they took everything in my room as evidence. And I was very focused on getting my grandmother's blanket she made me back. And so that was something that he had taken? That was something they had taken as evidence. Oh, they had taken. They had taken okay. all my bed bedding and everything. Do you feel like the police took the assault seriously? Yes, I think they were pretty earnest in their questioning, pretty detailed, certainly sensitive to what I'd been through. But they could offer me no hope, of course. I mean, we couldn't even do a sketch and... They said, you know, so far, you know, the fingerprints have been inconclusive. And and that was prior to DNA testing, right? I don't believe I don't believe DNA testing really came into play until the late 90s. No, I don't think so either. Uh, they basically said, you know, we'll let you know if we find anything. That's when I found out that the perpetrator had taken my underwear because they didn't they gave me everything back and my underwear was missing. So that's one of the things he took from the house, like a trophy. And he took my, my, my high school graduation ring. He rumbled through my purse and just found some. He didn't really steal anything of high value, um, but he had rummaged through my things and taken some things. What do you do after a sexual assault? Well, of course, I thought I need to go to counseling, right? So I went to counseling, and it was just so raw. It was so early. Um, I couldn't even verbalize, really, what I felt. I felt numb, really numb. So I spent probably the next, well, I, I continued in grad school. Amazingly, I didn't drop out of grad school, but 
I know I drank a lot more. I know depression hit me really hard. I was put on antidepressants. Um, There were times where I even wanted to kill myself. But never did I think that, okay, I'm storing all this somewhere and it's, it's coming out when I can't control it. I tried to adapt to that and to that normal and to start to, you know, feel my feelings, you know, and I did a lot of therapy and even went to the rape counseling center and, you know, I tried to do all the right things to, to heal, you know. And so at some point after the years rock on and you're, I graduated and I moved out of town and I just really thought the trail was cold, but there was so much. I remember trying to get out of the lease at the house I was raped in and the landlord wouldn't let me out of the lease um, because I hated being in that place. I hated it. Every night when I went to bed, I mean, I was just flooded. You know, it was an awful scenario to be in, to be in the bed that you were raped in. How long after the assault did you have to stay in the apartment? It was about, I I think our lease ran up in August. They usually run August to August for students. So, no, that's what it was. I re-signed the lease because I was still in my numb period when we re-signed in August. And I was like, oh, no, I've got this. I can handle this. And then after that, I realized how triggering it was. And so I tried to get out of the lease then. So it took me about six months after re-signing the lease to get out of it. They finally agreed to let me go a few months early. And that helped a lot getting out of the place and moving. Of course, we moved out of town and um, I got my first counseling job. I I was in school to be a counselor. So, you know, life went on, you know, it was like, well, they're never going to catch him. Did you stay in therapy during this time or did you start therapy and stop because it was so overwhelming for you and then got back in at a different point? Or was it something that you were consistent with? I stopped and started. Um, Early on when I went, I was too numb to process it. Even at the support group, I told the facilitator, I was like, I mean, these women are telling their stories. I'm not ready to tell my story. And she's like, that's okay, you know. And so I stopped going to the support group, and I did, you know, ever how many employee assistance sessions you get. I did several of those with a therapist and then I stopped for a while and then my depression got so bad and you know just feeling hopeless and and it's weird even though I was in school for counseling I never in the moment put that together you know that it was my put what together my sexual assault was causing a lot of my current symptoms you know, or facilitating a lot of trauma symptoms. I I knew I'd been traumatized, but I felt like I could contain it. Like I could put the genie back in the bottle and keep it in the bottle. And what happened was I didn't contain it very well. I mean, I had all sorts of anxiety, mood swings, you know, you name it. And so I got back in therapy and that was really good because it allowed me to start kind of piecing things back together. What was the time frame between you stopping and starting again? So I I left where I went to school in 2000. So it was probably about 2002 when I got back in regular therapy. So that was so it would have been a good good ten years nine years after after the assault, yeah, well, you must have functioned pretty well for nine years I, to get to well at least bury it. I don't want to say function well, that's the wrong term phrase to say, but you buried your feelings and your emotions on this assault for nine years before you really started dealing with it, yes, exactly, and then we had bought our first house in. 
I was at home one day and the phone rang and this was about 2000, 2005 and the phone rang and it was a, it was a number from where I went to school. So I thought, well, it might be somebody I know. So I answered it and it was the detective and he, he introduced himself and said, you probably don't remember me. I was a detective on your case, you know, way back when and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, oh, and he said, I want you to know something. We have gotten a grant to test 30 rape kits in our district. And he explained what that meant. He said, we now have the ability to cross-reference DNA from the kit with the perpetrator or the database of prisons, basically. And we've got the ability to do that. And we tested 30 kits and yours was one of them. I thought, oh, wow. You know, it was like kind of shocking. I was like, I didn't even know they could do that. And seven cases got what we call a cold hit, which means there's no disputing whatsoever that this person's DNA was evidence in your case. So this man was in the system somewhere, somehow at some point when they started testing DNA. Yes. He, Do you know what other crime he committed for his DNA to be in the system at this point? Did they inform you of any of that? I don't think they made a preference. I think they took everybody's DNA in the prison system. And, so he was already in prison. Right. He, but not for sexual assault. He had a long history of robbery, burglary charges. What I found out at court was he was on furlough from prison when he raped me. He was on a weekend oh pass from prison. A weekend pass. From prison when he raped me, yes. Uh, they give weekend passes. But <laughs> he had been a model prisoner, I guess. But um, so the man said they have seven cold hits from those 30 cases, and yours was one of them. He said, I know you got to think about it. This is a lot to process, but we would like to know if you would like to go forward with the grand jury and taking this to trial. So, of course, I was just dumbfounded because, first of all, I didn't think he would ever be caught, and second of all, I never thought it would be an opportunity to go to trial. And so I talked to my husband about it. And he was like, you know, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to take it to trial. I want to meet the person and stand in front of them and, and let them know that, you know, I'm here and I haven't forgot. And, and my husband agreed and was totally supportive. So I called the... Was your husband, your boyfriend at the time that this happened? Yes. And he had a really hard time too. It was very hard on him to process all this in the beginning. And then, you know, it's just, it, it, it affects everybody around the victim, not just the victim. I was like, I called the guy back and I said, yeah, I want to go for it. So that started the long process of going to grand jury. First, you go to grand jury, and then you, I have to tell them what happened in my own words. And, and I got hooked up with a victim service advocate, which she was so wonderful. She kind of walked with me through the whole process, and she was there for me every time I had to be at court. And so after the grand jury agreed to move forward, then, you know, a DEA was assigned and the case was put on the docket. But we went to grand jury in 2006 and we didn't go to trial until 2008. It took quite a long time, you know. So 15 years after your assault, you were finally getting to a point to where you were going to see this man face to face. And he was going to be put on trial for what he did. Yes. Yes. Did you know, did you know anything about him at this point? I had learned his name and I had learned his history that he, he had. And I, by this time I talked to the DA quite a few times, you know, we knew he was on furlough and that his family lived like 
maybe a quarter of a mile from where I, I lived. So it was so was he obvious. In the, did he live near you? Was he in the area at all? or was He, he was visiting his family who lived. He was visiting from, from prison. That's right. Yes. And they lived like a quarter mile from me. And um, I lived, you know, I lived around a lot of students. We weren't far from campus. I mean, I, I have no idea, you know, how many students lived on my street, but it was a lot of students, you know. He was probably an opportunist that went from door to door, you know, looking for a house he could get into. And my house was a duplex, and it the back door, I didn't have the deadbolt on. I had it locked, but no deadbolt. We never had any crime there. You never should feel safe. It was but a safe place to be. I felt a safe being alone at night, you know. And anyway, I did find out that there was another victim that, they didn't have enough DNA evidence on to take. Was it the same weekend? No, this was years before. He had victimized this person and they had gathered evidence, but didn't have enough evidence to perfectly connect him to her. So right up until the time my case went to trial, they were thinking about bringing her case with mine. And so I felt I mean, I felt so linked to this girl, and I was so sad when I found out that they weren't going to take her case. And And were you in contact with her? Did you speak to her? I wasn't able to speak to her. It wasn't proper to give her my name, but I called her out in my victim statement um, because I wanted that on record that she was his victim, too. And these were the victims we know about. His, His whole history that he was in prison for was burglary, robbery, you know, on and on and on. But how many times did he commit rape during the process? Exactly. These are just the women who may not have been confident enough to come forward. Right. And the trial lasted about a week. What happened when you came face to face with him for the first time in the courtroom? You actually got to see his face. Can you talk a little bit about what you felt in those in that moment? I was so I felt like so jumpy. Um, I mean, I felt so anxious. Like he he would never look in my direction. Not once. He didn't look at you. And that jumpiness and anxiety just turned to just raw anger because the whole time, even when I was testifying, his defense attorney would strategically like stand between me and him so that I could Interesting. see him. So you couldn't see him. Right. And then when I sat at the table with the DA, he was adjacent. So I couldn't see him then either. She was sitting. Was his, was his defense attorney aggressive with you or do you, do you think he was doing that to protect you or to protect him? I think I think she was trying to prevent I don't know what her defense was that um he was old, he had been in prison a long time, he was a model. So how old prisoner. was it? That that's a question we didn't talk about. How old was this man at this point of his conviction? He was probably in his fifties when he, at that point when he assaulted me. Oh, when he assaulted you, he was in his 50s. So that means... So 15 years later... He was in his 60s, yeah. And Mid to late 60s by then. Yeah. And he had already been, I guess, you know, he had, he had already been in and out of prison his whole life. So she, she, her job was to paint this story of this poorly educated man who had grown up with a lot of issues and never got the help he needed and you know, blah, blah, blah. When she stood in front of him, I felt like she was trying in a way to kind of keep me from reacting to seeing him. Maybe that would have been bad for the case. I don't know. But, you know, she defended him as, you know, as a defense attorney should. It was close to the end. But, oh, I got to tell you this. What amazed me because I sat with the DA the whole time. So I got to see everybody and I got to talk to the man 
that got the grant. He worked at the Alabama Bureau of Investigation in their in their lab. He was a real science nerd, but this was like his whole life's work to give victims justice. And he and I got to talk and it was just amazing when he told me, you know, how glad he was that I was, you know, doing what I was getting a chance to have justice, you know, and that that's the, all he ever hoped for. I was amazed. But then when he got on the stand and explained all the intricacies and the level of handling that they have to keep very limited with DNA evidence, you know, they don't want a lot of people touching it. It's called chain of custody. I mean, they followed the book. And that was one area where the DA tried to poke holes. I mean, the the defense attorney tried to poke holes was because I didn't know who this guy was. I mean, they were trying to poke holes in the fact that we could we convict this man based on DNA. And that is the best way to convict somebody is off of DNA evidence. Exactly. It was, what, it was 2008 at that time. So it was. They wanted to try to find a reason why somebody could have tampered with this or corrupted the evidence. And he had. He was not letting it happen. He was not letting it happen. He went through their protocol. I mean, it was just like, I mean, they do this every day. And, you know, they, they've got it down, you know, by the book. So that was really ex- encouraging. But then I got to the point where I testified. And I was going to ask if you went on the stand. I was very nervous. I mean, I was shaking and. Um, I just felt like I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait to get off the stand, really. <laughs> and I, I couldn't, I couldn't really say it all. You know, I felt like I said what I needed to. Were you able to go back in that moment, or did you stop yourself from going back in that moment at that point? I mean, it was 15 years later, and you'd gone through some therapy, but is a pretty traumatic experience for you. I mean. I left, I I answered the questions, but I didn't, I left stuff out, you know, because it was just too detailed and it was just, I think I was just nervous, but I could recall it like it happened yesterday because. I can't imagine that's something you're ever going to erase from your memory. The memories I have, and I'm sure I have blocked out some of them, but the memories I have I call it like they're seared in my brain. They will never go away. And granted, my memories are my perceptions, you know, but they're so like just stuck, you know, in your brain. And so I had no problem recalling the events from my perception. I've learned, you know, experiencing an event, you you latch on to certain things and you don't latch on to other things. So, but my experience and the memories I have will never leave me. I mean, I can go back to them like that. They don't impact me like they used to, but they certainly will stay there. So that was hard because I had a jury and the courtroom and then he was being blocked by his attorney. And I was just trying to get through the story basically. But everybody was like, you did great. You did great. You know, I didn't break down on the stand, but that week was terrible because I had to drive back and forth and my husband couldn't go and I would just cry all the way to court and all the way home. So you were in the courtroom by yourself. And um, I felt, but I didn't feel like I mean, the DA was amazing and the victim service advocate was amazing, but we had to go back to court. Oh, here's what happened to that. As I was leaving, the court ran all the way through Friday, of course, and we got out and we were leaving. No, we got the verdict read on Friday. That's what it was. And my husband came and some of my friends came to support me. So that was really nice. That's nice. And um, they announced the verdict, and he was um, accused of 
or he was convicted of robbery, burglary, and rape. He, he was facing charges of all three of those. Right. He got convicted on all three. And I just cried and my husband cried and we just held each other because it was so emotional. And I felt so much relief that the jury had heard me and believed the evidence and believed what had happened. And as we're leaving, the jury members were coming out and a couple of them came up to me and hugged me. And Oh, wow. I know. It was just so, it was just so emotional. There was so much relief and so much gratitude because I got this chance that I never thought I would get. And for the court, you know, to validate, you know, what had happened. It, you know, it was no longer just a memory for me. It was a true crime that had been acknowledged. But I knew that they, you know, they told me, well, you were the only person of the seven that wanted to go to trial. Oh, my goodness. And I said, well, that makes sense. You know, some people don't want to dig it all back up. It's a difficult thing. I can ima- I can only imagine. I mean, they've got new lives. Maybe their partners don't know about it. You know, it's not for everybody. It, it's really not. But And the only reason it went to trial is because, you know, he never pled out. He never, ever admitted his guilt. Even in the did he so he wasn't on the stand most probably most likely right he no, never he took never the stand took himself the stand. that makes sense he never his attorney never tried to offer a plea either they were going for not guilty and I wasn't ever going to let them accept the plea deal anyway because my whole thing was if I had any control over it but my whole thing was he needs to be a registered sex offender that's my that was my only goal. Whether this man is in prison for whatever, he needs to be a registered sex offender. You know, knowing that he was convicted of rape, I knew that would happen. So if he ever did get out of prison, you know, he would have this on his record. But we had to come back for sentencing. And that took an, almost a couple of years. Really? Yeah. It took a couple of years from his conviction to sentencing? Why did it take so long? Backed up system. But he was already in prison anyway. He wasn't going anywhere. For other crimes. Yeah. Yeah. But a couple of years, that blows my mind. So he had already been serving time for this before sentencing. So sentencing was when I got to do my victim impact statement. So you couldn't even move forward after the conviction for two years, and then you had to go back through your victim's impact statement two years after a conviction, bringing all of this back. So you really couldn't even move on yet. Right. There was still unfinished business. My goodness. I really wanted to do that victim statement. And my husband did it. My best friend did it. We all three did it. Oh, wonderful. Of course, his attorney stood between me and him the whole time. So I couldn't see (laughs) Again. Again. Oh, but it felt so good to get up there. And that's when I said his other victim's name. And of course, his attorney raised an objection, but I didn't care. I wanted I I wanted him to know that I knew that he raped her too. And that's just of who we know. Because I mean, more than likely this man was a serial rapist and he never got caught. Right. Which in retrospect, that's probably what I mean, that's why he covered my eyes, you know, so I couldn't identify him. He didn't anticipate DNA evidence coming up, you know, 15 years later. Well, in 1993, later. We had, none of us had a clue about <laughs> DNA evidence back then. So. I mean, criminals were having a field day, you know. I just got to keep them from identifying my face and I can do whatever I want. Ah, the horrific acts before DNA. I know. People got away with. So we did the victim's impact statement and he got three concurrent life sentences which is life sentences one for each charge which meant they had to serve concurrently he would be in jail for three life the rest of his life and he would be a registered sex offender so you know that was really great but he kept appealing 
I had to go back to court one more time in 2014 because he appealed all the way to the state Supreme Court. And his appeal was based on the idea that tampering of evidence, DNA, not conclusive, blah, 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 and deadly weapon. But his DNA was conclusive, right? Right. But they were, he wanted, he was just trying to appeal anything he could think of. I mean, he stayed in a state of appeal a- after the conviction, you know, what for the whole time. Human. And finally made it to the state Supreme Court. They actually ruled to reduce. Oh, and guess who was the um, chief justice of the state Supreme Court? Oh, yes. Say his name. Roy Moore. If anyone knows anything about Alabama politics. Roy Moore, the man whose history is so dark. Wasn't his accusation against a 14-year-old girl? Yes. He was banned from the mall because he trolled for teenage girls. So this man sat as chief justice in the the state Supreme Court when this appeals case came to them. He was one of the votes that said we should reduce the burglary and robbery charges because there's some element in Alabama law about there has to be a deadly weapon being used during that robbery and burglary. And he and some other justices, because I got the whole opinion sent to me, and he and some other justices said, well, that's not conclusive. You know, she couldn't identify a weapon. So we had to go back for resentencing in 2014. So they were going to Resentence based on these reduced burglary and robbery charges. And again, this man has never acknowledged his guilt to anyone. He's just appealed, appealed, appealed. So we were sitting in the court. I had the same DA, and she was like, Well, speak up if you think of anything. And I mean, nobody could remember the case. I mean, it was from 2008. Even I even had the same judge, and he probably couldn't remember the case. But when he was bringing up the reason, for the reduced charges, he said, oh, you know, because the weapon was not identifiable. And I just spoke up right at that point. I said, Your Honor, the reason I couldn't identify a weapon was because I was blindfolded. And the DA was like, oh, that's good. I'm so glad you said that. And I'm like, okay, good. Because <laughs> I just blurted it out. And, um, oh, I was so mad to be there. That At that point, having to go back to court in 2014, I was just pissed off. I was like, this guy is taking up my time, taking up court time to run through the system. And I've got to be here and look at him again. And I was just, oh, I was looking at him with so much hatred. And you said that was 2016? 14, yeah. 2014? Uh-huh. So 21 years later, you're still... You're still... Still in court or going back to court because he won't let it go. And, um, oh, if I could have just reached across the table and strangled him. And he's pretty old, you know, in 2014. He was getting a little bit feeble, but I thought I could, I could take him down. Really, I could. And, I don't um, think anyone would blame you for feeling that. <laughs> but... But luckily, um, when the judge heard that, I think it may have impacted him a little bit because maybe they had forgotten that piece of the case. Because when they re-sentenced him, he still gave him three consecutive life sentences. He gave so him he the, same the same sentence. Thing. Bravo, judge. Yeah. Bravo, judge. Oh, I'm so glad that he didn't get it reduced. I know. And that was really... Now, from time to time, I have to admit, I still check his profile in the prison system to make sure he's still in there. So you know what his face looks like now, obviously. Yeah. And his name. So I can look him up in the prison system because I want to know, A, when he dies. or He's still alive today. He's still alive. He's still alive today. Or B, you know, if for some reason he gets out on parole, you know, those are Absolutely. the two things I want to know. Of course, you know, the victim service people are supposed to contact you as well if that you know, but that's ultimately I did my last work on it. Um, I did a, a treatment called EMDR, 
um, which is basically desensitizing the trauma in your brain through eye movement or in my case I held paddles that went back and forth with a buzzing and you reprocess the trauma I still had a little bit of stuff there that I worked through in EMDR what year did you start EMDR it was just a couple of years ago just a couple of years ago okay prior to that I've always done just traditional talk therapy but um when I, when I got back in therapy a couple of years ago, it was amazing how there was still stuff there that lingered. The, the feeling of powerlessness, the feeling of hopelessness, you know, those things go very deep into the core of your being. And that never really fully, you know, you, you just... Throughout my life, I'm, I feel like things will integrate, but that was a good integration tool that had some stuff, some residual things. And that was, you know, so that was very helpful. And it, I, at one point, I even volunteered for a rape crisis center. It was many years after I'd been back in therapy, and I felt like I was ready to get back, and it was too much because we would sit with the victims during their rape exam and oh. talk to them immediately following the rape. And I mean, I felt like I did some good work with the people I worked with, but for days afterward, I would just be exhausted and I couldn't function. And I, I had to recognize, you know, this may be too much, you know, may have in a sense re-traumatized you every time you were sitting there and not, maybe even not even being conscious about it. Yeah you just your brain goes back to your own experience and um, you know that was one way I one way I tried to give back but ultimately you know I really just wanted to tell my story because you know, there's hundreds of thousands of untested rape kits in this country. And although some organizations have done some great work in shining the light on this problem, some states have passed legislation to get these tested. But, I mean, the ripple effect of people um, getting validation that they're kits were not just put in a storage unit and collected dust. I mean, that's essentially what we're doing in 2022. Even though we have DNA evidence. I had no idea that in 2022, when we have DNA at our fingertips, that these rape kits are just being collected and are sitting and not being tested immediately. Exactly. I had no idea. It's unbelievable that a crime of this nature that's so pervasive in our culture is basically a throwaway crime. You know, it's not given the attention and the resources it deserves. Why do you think that, why do you personally think that is through your experience through this? Why do you think that we are ignoring a truly pervasive problem in our country with rape culture? And that these, these you know, there are men that do go through sexual assault as well, but predominantly it's women. These rape kits are being collected and they are not being tested and they're being pushed aside. Correct. Yes. And it, I mean, rape affects everyone, of course. It, it affects trans, non-binary, people of color, it, it, it has no discrimination. It affects everyone. But definitely, you know, women predominantly have, you know, ex have, have experienced the bulk of what's been reported, at least. Your story seems to be an exception. Right. Honestly, when I do any research about rape or I read about rape cases or I watch documentaries on rape, your story seems to be the exception to what happens the majority of the time to women who are sexually assaulted or raped, to where you had support, you had police who did their job properly, 
you had a DNA kit that was, I mean, the grace that you received with being one of 30 randomly chosen in the state of Alabama for a rape kit by chance. And you, right. your, your perpetrator, your rapist was already in the system. And then he got three consecutive life sentences that was upheld. It's almost unheard of for someone to go to prison for the rest of their lives over rape in this country. And it's yes. a sad story. But what do you think we can do as a society to change this? I think we have to view it as one of the m rape and child sexual assault should be viewed as the horrible crimes they are. I mean, they should get priority in, in the system. I mean, I know compared to murder, they're not, right? Murder will always be number one, and it should be. But when you think about the ripple effect on, on families and individuals and children and parents and anybody that experiences this, or, or has a loved one that's experienced this, will be forever changed. And that impacts us in a, as a society when we are, you know, rape is a tool of war, and there's a reason for that. Because when in places like the Sudan, where they raped women as part of their war effort, they, they basically help that helped destroy the society when the women could not care for their children because of what they had been through or they couldn't procreate because of the ravage on their bodies. The tool of war was effective in, in decimating the Sudanese people. And it's always been a tool of war. I mean, anytime you hear people talk about soldiers, you know, how many stories of war have you heard that? ended up in somebody getting raped. Some soldiers came in the house during the Civil War and raped the Southern Belle, or the little French woman in the French countryside during World War II, even to stories of our own soldiers, you know, raping women during Vietnam. Absolutely. And, yeah. and children. I mean, if this is such a destructive tool, and it, it, it's seen as a way to destroy an entire subset of the population, why would we not see it as, as problematic as it is? I mean, rape statistics are not aired on the nightly news. They are not. We talk about the murder rates. When's the last time we talked about the sexual assault rate? You know, college campuses sweep it under the rug. We sweep it under the rug during elections in this country. Exactly. I mean, we have, we have this system set up that tells us, we're, okay, we're going to put this person on a list and they're going to have to report to us. And that's going to keep them from raping anybody else. Yeah, you made an interesting point when we were having a conversation about this the other day off air about people who are sexual, who sexually assault or rather it be women or even at the level of pedophilia. You made a really interesting point to me on your opinion on this, being a counselor for as many years as you've been and then being through this, about you don't think this is anything that is recoverable. People cannot recover, recover from being sexual predators. No, I, I fully believe that. So talk about, your, talk about your opinion on your professional and personal experience opinion on that. Well, you know, there's different type of rapists, but serial rapists, um, very much follow a pattern of serial killers. And, you know, they've tried any number of things in treating these people in prison, even down to, you know, chemical castration. But that does not stop their fantasy life, and it does not stop their need for power. And so what often happens if a person can't rape with their own organs they rape in other ways, you know. Um, they might use objects or simply become voyeurs in, 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 and invade a woman's privacy to the point that she feels stalked. But 
there's many ways that you can victimize, even if your sexual organs don't function. And so they've run up against all the problems and how do we deal with this? So, you know, of course the, the solution is to let them out on, you know, let them out for good behavior. Or slap, give them a slap on the hand, you know, because it might ruin their lives sitting in prison. Right. We, we don't want to ruin their lives. And, but most serial rapists and a lot of rapists are serial rapists, meaning they don't just offend one time. They offend multiple times. So you think about that when you have this person in prison, like, for instance, this person who sexually assaulted me. How many more women or people were assaulted by him? We'll never know. No. Because there's still so much shame around it. And because of victim blaming, which we've become very good at as a society, we continue to look for reasons to justify why a person can't be a rapist rather than it's entirely plausible. Or justifying why somebody, quote unquote, deserves to be raped. Right or brought it onto themselves, which is a pervasive problem in our society. Um, I mean, I ran into the stereotypes myself. I had people tell me that, you know, if that would have been me, I would have gotten away. People don't know right. what they're going to do unless they're, I can't even imagine. I have been groped as a woman. I have been groped on many occasions, but I can't even begin to make a statement like that. And I'm a pretty strong woman physically and mentally strong woman. And I cannot even begin to guess at what my response would be in that moment. I mean, my initial response to anything is usually fight. So I imagine I would fight. But would I be able to get away? I have no idea. You have no idea for someone to make that judgment, not going through that situation. That is a level of shame toward you and calling you or, or labeling you as weak in some respects that you couldn't get away. So is it's your fault? Because that's how I look at a statement like that. It is blaming you for not being in control enough over a strange man coming and putting himself on top of you in the middle of the night in your well, home. Well, and there's obviously a reason why people do that. They do that, they victim blame because they're so uncomfortable with it. And they can't possibly imagine, or they maybe have had a scenario where it's happened to them and they don't know how to deal with it. So it's, it's almost like if I can think of a reason why this could happen to her and not to me, it'll, the world will make sense. You know, everything will make sense if I can figure out how this won't happen to me. And that's living in denial and that just that just enables the system right. of denial to continue. Because, you know, we, we're still stuck in the idea that, you know, we are just now in the 21st century starting to wrap our brains around trauma and, and the impact of trauma. And, and we still, you know, we expect victims to be perfect. Like, when she goes to trial, does her story match each time she tells it? I mean, how? Trying to find holes and to poke holes into. In people, you know, so that they can justify why, you know, she can't be telling the truth. And there is no payoff or reward for being a survivor and telling your story. The fact that I'm telling my story today is not going to get me awards and money and, or anything. It, it's a no. vulnerable moment, but it, it's not like I, if I made this whole thing up, I would get any kind of payoff from it, right? Exactly. Why would I make something up that's... And I think that's a, a great point that you make because I feel like most women don't come forward because they're not going to be believed or because you said like the level of shame that uh, their community is going to turn against them, their family is going to turn against them, it's going to affect their reputation, it's going to... It's all going to fall on their shoulders and not the perpetrator's shoulders whatsoever. Right. Did you have that experience at all in your life, throughout your life? I mean, your, your husband was your boyfriend at the time, so clearly that relationship was strong. 
But did you have family or friends who backed off from you because of what happened? I think because I repressed it so much, I didn't experience the, you know, the backing off. I think if I had been very vocal and talked about it a lot, I probably would have seen more of that because people don't want to hear you talk about it. And when I did talk about it, I mean, you can you can cut the discomfort with a knife. I mean, it's pretty palpable. Um, but I was luckily, you know, I knew there were certain people I could talk to, but I didn't want to talk about it because mm. it was so raw. And of course, the primary feeling I felt was guilt. And the guilt was... So you did feel guilt. Because in the moment of the rape, I thought the worst thing that could happen was that he would kill me. And then after the rape, I felt like I don't know if death is worse than how I feel right now. I feel so empty and so violated and so dirty and so awful. I like just hate myself. And I didn't think, I, I, I felt guilty because I was like, I was trying to survive, but this is not life. This is not living, you know, to feel this terrible about yourself and that you, in a moment of crisis, didn't do enough to get out of it because that's what you're left with, you know. That's the hardest thing to work for. That was the biggest thing to, for me to overcome was the feeling like I should have done more. And, you know, there was definitely, and definitely in learning about how trauma plays itself helped me with that, you know. And also the stages I went through, like the whole numb stage, you know, I learned that that was absolutely normal. <laughs> I imagine it um, is. And it doesn't mean that, you know, I was, it doesn't mean I couldn't recover, but I just wasn't there yet, you know, in that journey. But, you know, we don't arm people with enough information, I don't think, to help them realize that, that, you know, if, if you experience a sexual assault, you're going to struggle with all kinds of emotions and you're going to be maybe self-destructive in some ways. And all of that is a response. I think we see that play out in society a lot, especially with women who never receive help. Right. They never get the vindication. They are not believed for whatever reasons. Um, I think that happens with trauma a lot, period. So it, but it was so a sexual assault. I can imagine that's even more yeah, so. Yeah. I mean, I, w I wish there was like, you know, the Me Too movement was good because people acknowledged, you know, some people for the first time that they had experienced sexual harassment, sexual assault, something like that. Yeah. You know what the part about the Me Too movement that just infuriates me, though, since you brought that up? I cannot tell you how many conversations I had with men in my life who, during the Me Too movement, at the beginning of the Me Too movement, who was saying to me, because I am the mother of a son, and who made remarks to me as a mother of a son that it's going to be, he's going to have a hard time. He's going to have a hard time as a boy because a woman can just scream sexual assault at any moment and not even really have to prove it. How many conversations I had and how many comments were made to me like that. And it just infuriates me. How about raising your men to be better men? How about we start there? Because I am raising my son to the point where he knows the difference between right and wrong and knows when a girl says no, she means no, you stop, you back off immediately. I don't care if you're in the middle of the damn act. You stop right now if she says no. It is your responsibility. It is not her fault at all when she says no. I don't care if you're hot and heavy in the moment. And for men to put that responsibility back on women's shoulders we are going to make lies up. We are going to make excuses up. Again, it's the burden falls on us as, as women. And it, it, they completely remove themselves from the responsibility of it. So many men in my life I had that conversation oh, with. That's it so just infuriating. Me. Because, I mean, we do have a responsibility as women and men to, uh, to speak up if we see something askew. Absolutely. I mean, there's 100%. no telling how many parties or bars or typical events 
people go to in their life where if they just pay attention, they might be able to get a sense of something that's off and they can act, you know, you can, you can act like the person's your friend and take them to the bathroom. If you see a, if you see a person that is, you know, had too much to drink and offer them a ride or. Absolutely. Step in and treat them if it's your sister. Right, right. Or your brother, if it's and a male. And men you know. especially have to be very cautious around other men about not endorsing. Boys will be boys. Yeah. Or Ugh. I'm going to, I'm going to get a really drunk and then she won't know the difference. So things like that, you know, they, they can put pressure on each other. Same with women. I mean. Let's face it. There are women out there who are predators, and it, sure, there. If are. you know Absolutely. your friend is is attracted to a fourteen year old boy, I mean, say something. Say something. Stop it. Yeah, no, women are not excluded from being sexual predators. I we've learned that in the news over the past few years with some of these teachers who were convicted and sent to prison over, you know, having sexual relations with 14-year-old students in the seventh and eighth grade. So women are not, are definitely not excluded from the conversation of being sexual predators at all. But, you know, it's like the conversation you and I had about this off, off air as well. It's the opinion of a lot of men in situations like that is like, oh, you know, lucky kid. Yeah. Lucky kid. You know, if I had a hot teacher, I wish I had had a hot teacher at that age. I, that is just as wrong as if it were a male teacher assaulting a 14-year-old female student. Absolutely. And, and, you know, kids have, kids have to be kids no matter what. They don't need that pressure. Even if they welcome the attention, there's got to be an adult that steps up and, te- and announces and makes sure that it's, it's spoken about, you know, to the right Absolutely. people to stop it. I mean, I know some girls would love, you know, to get attention, um, probably, but they don't know better. When you're 13 or 14 and you have a crush on a teacher and he starts flirting with you, we now know that it's grooming, but um, we we shouldn't expect 13-year-old, 14-year-old girls to know that. We have to... Not even a little. Yeah. Not even a little. They're still learning how to date or not even date yet. But, you know, for so long, women were seen as property. People married off their daughters. And in some circles in this country today, women are still seen as property. They are married off at a young age so they can be the most fertile. And they're treated like, you know, uh, they're not treated equally at all. And that, that's, of course, where any marginalized group can be. Um, victimized for the same reason. When you're Absolutely. already seen as unequal and your power is unequal, you can bet there's going to be somebody there to victimize you or marginalize you. Well, and we're we're seeing that play out in this country right now too, with all with a lot of new laws. Yeah, you know, where where women are seen as property, and you know the men have to control right. our bodies for us because we're not intelligent enough to do it ourselves. Right. We 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 can't have that. We can't have women making decisions for their own bodies. Oh goodness, no. So, I mean, clearly shame plays a big role in this, and we need to start taking this seriously as a society. I feel like women are the ones that really have to step up more. So what kind of advice can you give or suggestions to women who find themselves in situations where they are sexually assaulted, knowing that it's a a major trauma for them, that it's going to be difficult to move on from it? But what can we do? What can you suggest to them to do? What kind of systems do you think we could put into place to support girls and women who go through these traumatic experiences to where we can start doing more as a society to prevent it or to at least hold the people accountable. And maybe holding them accountable at a higher level, we see less and less assault happen Mm -hmm. because it's going to be taken seriously versus swept under the rug or a pat on the back. Well, first of all, I think we need units, facilities, where victims can be interviewed, 
I mean, this happens a lot now, but it's certainly not everywhere. You know, special units at the police department, if the police are called, there needs to be nothing but trauma sensitivity all the way down. I mean, I know the job of the police department or the job of the rape kit is to gather the evidence, but it doesn't mean you have to approach it, you know, in such a cold way because this victim is suffering. And just like that doctor, that that one small act from that doctor in that ER gave me my humanity back. And so we can't underestimate how we approach victims of sexual assault, whether that be in our families or in the legal system. They're already hating themselves more than you know. And so any act of kindness or just being sensitive in how you approach things can make a world of difference. And so, you know, having places set up where they can get confidential rape kits done or just having a special place in the hospital or you know, having social workers set aside, you know, if a rape victim comes in. I mean, we just need to treat it with the respect. We need to treat the victims with respect and humanity. And and even if they don't go to the police, even if they just, if they tell somebody, if they can tell one person, and that they trust and not keep the secret, it can help a whole lot because keeping the secret is really what piles the shame on. I mean, even if you could just go to your, a family member or a friend or somebody that you can trust, you know, the legal path is not for everybody. And, you know, it's sometimes very difficult and arduous to go to court, but keeping the secret inside is really of it can just add to the difficulty of recovery so it's important if you've been assaulted to not keep that to yourself and and but some people don't have anybody they can trust but luckily most cities have rape crisis lines and they're manned 24 7 so if you have a if you've been assaulted you can talk to someone who's going to understand immediately you know and they're not going to pressure you to go to the police or anything. They're simply going to talk to you and figure out how you can be safe, you know, help you figure that out. And so that's the number one thing is 50 years ago, people didn't talk about it at all. People would keep all their stories to themselves. And there's resources to help. You know, most rape crisis centers have free counseling, free support, the victim's advocacy units set up in the court system they will pay they will help pay for medical expenses if you have any of course the the sexual assault kit does not cost money but like if you had other injuries they would help pay for that or if you had to take time off work i mean most victims advocacy groups in most legal systems are pretty pretty good at helping you you know get support after a violent crime. And that was the other thing. This is how your mind works, right? I never thought I was a victim of a violent crime. Not till I went to court and I heard that DA say over and over and over this violent act. And then I started putting it together and I was like, why did I not think it was a violent act? Oh, because they didn't cut me up or break my bones. Interesting. I had a perception that I was not a victim of violent crime because the scars were emotional and and the assault was not violent enough, I guess you would say. That was one of my flawed perceptions. But hearing someone else refer to it over and over as a violent crime helped me to integrate that and think, oh, yeah. It was a violent crime, and I was, I was a victim of violence. And so teaching sexual assault victims that it is a major violent crime 
should be one of our goals as society, using the, using the real language and not trying to soften it. The very act of sexual assault is a violent crime. It doesn't matter what accompanies that or doesn't accompany that. If someone assaults you sexually, that is violence. You know, if you've, it doesn't have to be that you're, you know, broken to pieces and, and have a thousand scars or a bullet hole. Just being sexually assaulted is violence. And yeah, that's very important because I didn't believe that for a long time. I didn't believe I was injured enough. Till, for 15 years until yeah. you heard somebody say it. I didn't think I had enough scars, even though the emotional scars almost took me out, you know. I didn't count those. I only counted the physical scars. I don't think we can say that enough, that emotional scars can be more damaging than physical scars. Right. Physical scars heal pretty quickly. Yes. Your emotional scars are with you your entire right. life. There's a whole lot I could say about the symptoms, and we may get into that on a later show, but... We will get into that on a later show, Some yes. of the symptoms that accompany it are just amazingly difficult to overcome of trauma. So, you know, there's flashbacks, um, there's nightmares, panic attacks, you mean, you name it, the whole gamut, you know, but it's a lot... Everybody experiences those a little differently, but yeah, there's a lot of common characteristics of trauma, sexual trauma that are very easy to, you know, easy to spot in somebody else or in yourself, even if you're looking. But I just want to empower victims to not feel alone and like there's no one um, because being alone in your own head is a very scary place to be. And finding an outlet, finding a support is just so critical. And I, I can't say that enough that, you know, and it's a journey. It's not an easy, quick thing, but every day is not a bad day. And, and, and things do get better. I was on the path to healing before I went to court. You know, and even if my case had a nev had never gone to court, I think I was moving to a good place. But um, I'm grateful. I'm so grateful that the DNA evidence was there and it got tested. And that's what I want from every victim is to have that chance. But even if you don't get that chance, you know, there's a path to healing you know, that, that can happen. I just want people to be empowered by that and to know that, you know, you're not alone. I mean, it sex, I mean, there's women being sex, there's people being sexually assaulted every minute, you know, so there's people out there who understand and, but I really want to see more victims getting a chance to have their options with DNA evidence and not leaving these things on the shelf. Absolutely. And so episode three of Powerful Conversation to Humanhood, we are going to go a little bit more in depth into the trauma of sexual assault and then also talk about uh, more in depth into these rape kits and um, what we can do to try to get more of them tested and why they are not tested. So we'll get into that in a in an upcoming show very soon. Is there anything that you want to say in closing? I really appreciate this. I was it really feels like I've come full circle telling this story like that this. makes me happy. Yeah. I feel like, you know, that's like a big piece for me and I appreciate the forum to do it and I hope it helps somebody. Um I know it's helpful to me. Thank you. I hope we can help even even if we help one person through this. If one person hears this and is able to get their justice or recover, whatever that looks like for them, it's a good thing, you know, what we're doing. And I know that it was really difficult to talk about this. And I appreciate you so much for finding the strength to do it. I know it wasn't hard. I know it was hard, rather. And I can't thank you enough for being willing to go public with it and tell your story. Thank you so much. 
Thank you for listening to the first official episode of Powerful Conversations Humanhood. If you are a victim of sexual assault, please know that you are not alone and it is not your fault. You are strong and you can recover from this. In our show notes for this episode, we provide information on resources along with links and phone numbers for support. You can also reach out to us directly at pcspodcast.com and click on our contact tab or email us directly at info at pcspodcast.com and we will help direct you to support. Over the next two episodes of Powerful Conversations Humanhood, we continue our discussion on sexual assault and the pervasiveness of it within our society. In episode two, we will hear the raw story of a father and coach of young sexual assault victims at the hands of a man he trusted with their safety. In episode three, Leisha and I dive further into the conversation discussing the trauma of sexual assault, resources for support, and the ongoing work of the Joyful Heart Foundation and hashtag end the backlog movement of untested rape kits and justice for sexual assault victims. Thank you for listening to this episode of Humanhood. We are happy you are here. For a breakdown of this episode, please visit pcspodcast.com backslash humanhood for our show notes and for more information on how you can get involved. If you enjoyed this podcast, please help us grow by giving us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and supporting us through Patreon by becoming a founding member. As a founding patron, you receive a special subscription rate that will lock in for the life of your subscription. We provide our patrons with a plethora of awesome behind the scenes perks and special merchandise, along with access to our Patreon exclusive podcasts, Drunk Politics and WTF. Become a founding member today at patreon.com backslash powerful podcasts or find the link in our show notes. This podcast is brought to you by Powerful Podcasts and is written, produced and hosted by me, Tamara Graham, with co-host Leisha Moody Miller. You can find us at pcspodcast.com or wherever you find your podcasts. For a full list, please refer to our website. Follow us on social media at Powerful Podcasts and on Twitter at Powerful Pods. Be sure to join us next week for another powerful episode of Humanhood. Humanhood.